at this hour, we repeat, these are the facts as we know them. And that's when she looked in the rearview mirror. Some technology from another dimension, another world. You're still afraid. I don't know what it was. It's a sign of life that This one will scare you. I'm Shannon Brown, and this will scare you. My guests today are Jay Light and Frank Castillo. Jay is a comedian whose debut album, Good Guy with a Gun, is out now wherever you get music, and Frank is a comedy store paid regular and roast battle champ. Thank you for joining me, guys. Hey, thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, so today we're going to be talking all about the Comedy Store. Um, I've got some stuff, some uh, reasons why it might be haunted, and then we'll hear from Jay and Frank on their experiences. So, the Comedy Store is known as the spot to see up-and-coming comics and famous headliners alike, but there's some talent there that doesn't leave after last call. There are growls, the feeling of eyes upon you, Furniture stacked on its own, and humanoid figures are rumored to make themselves known. Sam Kinison actually had some strange experiences when he performed at the comedy store. He was a former Pentecostal preacher, and many said that shone through in his stage presence, most notably his screaming. Some people think that his religious background may have had something to do with things, and other people think his screaming stirred up the spirits. Hissing noises were frequently heard over the speakers when he spoke into the microphone, and one person believed they heard a voice saying, it's him, during Kinnison's act. While on stage one night, Kinnison demanded the ghost to show him itself. All the lights in the building immediately went out. One apparition that's reported is a man who wears a World War II bomber jacket. He's seen most often in the upstairs office and in the comedy store's kitchen. Witnesses say they see him crouching or hiding and then disappearing, and some people think he was one of mobster Mickey Cohen's victims. Others have reported hearing voices, being shoved, and objects like tables, chairs, and candles moving on their own. Before it was the comedy store, it was known as Ciro's, which opened on January 29, 1940 on the Sunset Strip in West Hollywood. Now, the area is not as glitzy, but back then it was the place for celebrities and socialites. That was the height of Hollywood glamour. Inside was done up in over-the-top Baroque decor, which was rich with color and texture, red silk sofas, ceilings painted a matching red, and walls draped in heavy silks. But the outside was plain and unassuming, making it a popular spot for celebrities like Marilyn Monroe, Lucille Ball, and Desi Arnaz, the Rat Pack, James Dean, and Judy Garland. The owner, William Wilkerson, was a big shot club owner who was proud to cater to high profile clientele. He had phone jacks installed at every table so guests could make important phone calls and a spotlight at the entrance to greet every star who entered. There were hidden rooms as well, a woman's parlor, and a gambling room for more private meetings. Next door was a popular brothel, and many people assume that patrons pass between the two establishments nightly. Ciro's was also no stranger to mobsters. Bugsy Siegel was a friend, fan, and future business partner of Wilkerson's, and he was also a regular at Ciro's when he wasn't in jail. When he was awaiting trial for murder in 1941, he refused to eat jail food and had the club deliver food directly to his cell. His girlfriend, uh, yeah, (laughs) you could just do whatever you wanted in the 40s. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, His girlfriend also frequently rented out Ciro's for parties, paying thousands in cash and telling Wilkerson that if he had any other events scheduled for that same night, it was now canceled. By 1942, Wilkerson got bored with Ciro's and sold it to a guy named Herman Hover. As more nightclubs, restaurants, and hotels popped up on the Strip, Ciro's held steady in popularity. Hover was forced to pay off Mickey Cohen, a friend and business associate of Bugsy Siegel. Cohen ran an extortion racket on the Sunset Strip from his clothing shop called called Michael's Exclusive Haberdashery at 8804 Sunset. 
Every single week, one of Cohen's employees would bring over empty boxes from the haberdashery to Ciro's, and employees would hand over bags of cash. Stars like Nat King Cole and Sammy Davis Jr. performed there, but the real entertainment came in the form of Real Housewives-level drama. Celebrities punched and spit on journalists, and Frank Sinatra got in so many fistfights over Ava Gardner, he was almost banned for life. There's also a rumor that the basement was used by the mob as a secluded area to torture and kill those who cross them, and some believe victims are buried beneath the basement floor. Other rooms are thought to have been makeshift hospital rooms for showgirls, sex workers, and mob girlfriends who needed discreet abortions. By the mid-50s, Vegas was becoming the hot spot, and mobsters and movie stars followed the action. The Sunset Strip was becoming less trendy, and many of the legendary clubs went under. Sears changed hands a few times and names before becoming the Comedy Store in April of 1972. Jay Leno, Richard Pryor, Sam Kinison, Mark Marin, Letterman, and Robin Williams all came up at the Comedy Store, and owner Mitzi Shore saw the venue as a showroom for comics, a place for them to work out material and get discovered. But those acts were bringing in some serious cash. Now, Jay and Frank, you guys can elaborate on this, but a lot of non-comedy people might not know that you don't always get paid for every single show that you do. Yeah. It's uh, the comedy store. They have two rooms that have uh, for the paid regulars. They get paid uh, for their shows. But a lot of the shows, I'd say the majority of the ones in the belly room and the, in the main room are non paid regular shows. So probably not going to get paid. Yeah. Well, not to say that whoever's running those shows won't pay the headliners they book. It's just like not everyone on that show is going to be getting paid. You know what I mean? It's usually like the only the headliners getting paid on that. Right. Yeah. Like a lot of people who don't do comedy or they aren't like, you know, in the culture or what have you. I think a lot of them think that every show that you do, even if it's just an open mic, that you're getting paid like to do your art, you know? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember there was an article in the Hollywood Reporter a couple of years back that was like, this is what uh, 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 an entry-level comedian can make in Hollywood. And it was like, they can make like $50,000 a year. <laughs> yeah, and, and I was like, in what? Like, in, are, are chicken tenders? Are we trading yeah. those in for cash now? <laughs> yeah, all the bar tickets. Yeah, who are you interviewing? Uh, TikTok comics? Like, you know, like that's not... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So it's pretty uncommon to get paid even today, uh, unless you're rather well known or the booker has money to pay you, uh, Mm -hmm. which is why even today we most recently heard about like UCB being under fire for taking a small business loan on top of making money hand over fist and not paying performers. Yeah. And right. You know, it's it's kind of crazy, but it goes back decades. So inspired by the labor unions, comics went on strike to get paid for their work at the comedy store in the 70s. Jay Leno, David Letterman and even Mitzi's friend Steve Lubetkin were amongst those in the strike. Tensions grew as negotiations failed and comics crossed the picket line in an effort to grab stage time and further their careers. And a non-strike comic even drove their car through the picket line. I don't think anyone was seriously injured, but it was it was a tense time in comedy. Uh, this, of course, strained Mitzi's relationship with many comics, namely Steve Lubetkin. Lubetkin, like many, struggled with mental health issues, and on June 1st, 1979, he jumped off the roof of the 14-story Continental Hyatt next door to the comedy store. He landed on the parking ramp between the hotel and the store. In his final note, he wrote, my name is Steve Lubetkin. I used to work at the comedy store. By the way, he was fun 31. fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, was <laughs> aiming, he was aiming for Mitzi's car because Mitzi's car was parked in the parking lot always. Like she has a spot that's designated for her car that's within. You can see it from the hotel. He was trying to land on it to send Jesus a bigger message. Christ. Yeah, yeah, but he also 
apparently everyone thinks jumping off the roof is like wildly fucking coyote. Like you have to get a running start. And also like you don't keep moving. Like you go as far as you can and then gravity kicks in. So it's yeah. like he would have had to have, you know, gone to the gym or like be like in a like a way better athlete at mm-hmm. leaping. You know what I mean? To even get to that. So Yeah, or like catch a, a power line midway through and sort of trapeze your way over. Yeah, that it's much that makes it much darker just generally like generally it's a very sad dark thing but like aiming for Mitzi's car makes it even worse so if you are someone who believes in hauntings it's easy to believe that the comedy store has its fair share of ghosts with devastating losses violence murder unsafe abortions and tormented souls are the common grounds for hauntings especially if you factor in the rumor that mobsters buried bodies in the basement So Jay Moore claims to have had an experience where he would have cold spots on the right side of his neck and face while he was performing. And one night he had the sudden realization he had been on stage for eight minutes, but nobody was laughing. He said he said it was like he was literally looking at a portrait of an audience like they were frozen. Yeah, no, that's just (laughs) that's just Jay Moore's set. (laughs) Yeah, I was like, okay, so not to discount anyone's experiences, if someone had something happen to them and they believe it to be true, sure, but I really wish I would have had the mindset to do that back when, like, my sketch group was bombing or I was doing Mm -hmm. open mics and just be like, man, it's definitely not my material. It's it's, a ghost. ghost. It's an other world entity. Yeah, ghosts are doing this to me, so it's fine. Uh, but he uh, so apparently it occurred to him that it was a ghost but he thought the ghost couldn't get to him so the ghost was only affecting one person who would like have a good laugh and that laugh would make everyone laugh so he thought he had to like break this thing that was happening so he said once he realized what was (laughs) once he realized this he uh, yelled out loud, fucking enough of this shit. Get the fuck out of here, ghost. And the, the audience reacted immediately, which, yes, if you're an audience and you're sitting there during someone's set and then out of nowhere they start screaming at a ghost, they will react to that. Right. Yeah. Like, right. Especially if they've been bombing the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the, yeah. It's the ghost of bombing. Yeah. Yeah, like it's easy to as a comic, it's easy to start blaming the audience oh, when yeah. you bomb, but to yeah, blame yeah. a ghost, it's like a whole other level of just and to see it happen yeah. live, man, yeah. I can only imagine what that audience. That's thought. so funny. Yeah. You had uh, you had brought up a ghost on a bomber jacket that disappears from the kitchen. I was like, that just sounds like the talent coordinator. I don't know if that's an actual <laughs> ghost. That just sounds like yeah. Adam not wanting to talk to anybody. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, now I know you guys have both had experiences and like in a lot of the research I've been doing and stuff I've been listening to, people do say like, yes, obviously drugs and alcohol are present at comedy clubs. But, um, you know, a lot of people say that that doesn't discredit what they've experienced. So, you know, if you I don't know which one of you guys might want to go first to start Uh, us off with your experiences there. I've got like I think I've got like. Two, I've got like two good stories. Not good stories. They're not long, but I got two stories. And I think Jay was there for like maybe a few. Perfect. I've got so two let's stories. go. Do you want to do back one back and one, or you want to do like back to back? Uh, how about you go first? Because I want to hear. Because I feel like yours might yeah. be different from mine. Style. And if and if we have the same perfect, perfect. Channel. Um, so I I haven't seen anything. And I've really wanted to like, I've, I really <laughs> want to see something and I've, mm-hmm. I've heard from people. And then I've also been in the room when someone's had an experience. So like, I remember, um, in the original room cover booth, I remember, uh, an employee, there's a spot in the back. And I remember, uh, Sarah who used to be an employee. She had like a seizure and like, yeah, like full on, like had a seizure, like fell down, had a whole thing. And it was like, it was like early in the show. It was like show hadn't let in yet. It was like a whole thing, right? And then I remember um, about two weeks later, someone else had a seizure in the exact same spot. And it was just an audience member. And it was oh just God. like, yeah, it was just kind of like that was really fucking weird. And um, I also remember Jesus Trejo was on stage once. Do you remember this one? This is this. This is a st- I was working. That's what it was. Yeah. 
I was sitting in the yeah. other. I was sitting watching his set. Yeah. In the OR. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Okay. Because I remember yep. Randolph was uh-huh. working the room, and I think I was yep. back door that night, and I came in because it was late. Jesus had uh, he had like the twelve fifteen or the twelve thirty spot that night. I think he was on late, and uh, he was performing, and then all of a sudden uh, he said that he felt. He, he asked if the air conditioning had kicked on because he felt a cold spot. Just like Jay Moore. Yeah. And uh, and Randolph, the guy who was working the room, went to go check and see if the air conditioning was on, and it wasn't. And so then he took a picture on stage of, uh, of Jesus, and there was like an orb of something, like a wisp floating by. Yeah, and Ugh. fucking Mexicans, yo, we believe that shit, bro. It is like, <laughs> yeah, we don't, yeah, it is. And Jesus was fucking a little nervous. He was like, it felt, he was like, yeah, I think he's, I don't know if he said he heard of something, but he definitely felt like someone, he he was even, he was like, was there like a, a, a person or like a comic talking to me? And he's like, no, he's like, yeah, I swear. I think he, I, yeah, I think he, I, he said he heard yeah, something yeah, whispering yeah. or something like oh that. Too. Yeah, but the other thing about, see, I'm always like, I always try to be like, you know, logical and shit. So, that back curtain there's a hallway that leads to the back bar it's it it is boarded up but there's still it's a door that can open you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so sometimes you can hear conversations pour in that's like if i have to be kind of logical about it you you know conversations are more in wind or whatever but even then he wasn't he wasn't on that side of the stage and there was a really thick curtain in between so it's like right and there was something yeah. in the picture, and Jesus was so freaked out he didn't come back to the store. Oh yeah, God. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the other one I had was uh, you remember Cody Morley? So Cody Morley yeah. uh, used to do stand. Well, I mean, I don't know if he ever did stand up. That's the mystery. Um, but he <laughs> is a really he's a cool dude, a really funny comic, and you know we'd always get stoned. And Cody was kind of a cool dude, a really funny comic who'd never who you'd never do <laughs> yeah, 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 comedy. Yeah. You don't got. You, gotta, you don't got to. But gotta we no. Up. He was a legitimately nice kid, and I would. We'd always. I I love shitting on him just because. He just smoked. He he smoked you out. <laughs> he was a fun <laughs> kid to have around that would also smoke weed with, and. Uh, but I remember this fucking dude. He, you know, people sometimes you'd stay late night, especially one o'clock, two in the morning, to watch you know the late night sets, and uh, sometimes people fall asleep in the booths. And door guys or security people, it's like we've been there for aura eight hours. We ain't, you know, sometimes we don't check everything or whatever the fuck because we're trying to get the fuck out. So apparently he passed out in the OR in one of the back booths, like laying down to the where he was like laying down under the table and they couldn't see him because sometimes you just fuck. It's a comfy booth. Um, so he said that he passed out and they closed up and he woke up at like 3.30 in the morning he said it was like hour bro he said he woke up like this he was like up and the first thing he noticed is how fucking cold it was he was like it was so fucking cold and immediately i woke up and was like i need to get the fuck out and he (laughs) he, it was one of the things that when they lock up the store you can't just walk out the front door because it'll set the whole alarm off it's a whole thing so he he knew about that so he was like fuck so he was like um he knew that the second he had to look for a place that didn't have uh, the alarm thing, right? So all the doors are like locked and shit. He said it was the fucking weirdest, creepiest feeling he's ever had. He said it sounded like people were having conversations deep in the store that you could hear. He was like, but it sounded like it was right behind the door. You know what I mean? He was like, it sounded like people were having conversations in the main room. But they were right at the door. He was like, and you could like put your ear up to the right, and it sounded like people were like whispering. Ah, 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 ah. And it, he was like, it was fucking. He was like, it was unsettling. He was like, everything was cold. He was like, it was just, it was like bad. I needed to get out of there. And uh, he ended up going up to the second floor, which is where the belly room is. And in that stairwell, there's a, a window that you can open up and get out of. And that's what he did. He ended up having to climb down the fire escape. But he said <laughs> the whole time he was trying to open up the window, he could just feel like the voices start to get like louder and stuff. But then he was like, it was just uncomfortable. He's like, I had to get out of there. Yeah. Yeah. That was like oof, getting stuck there after hours. That's not, that's not a, that's not fun. No. And yeah, I would like hate for that. people who think like, all right, that guy, you said he was a stoner. It could have just been him hallucinating. I don't know anyone who like smokes weed or does edibles and then like hallucinates like ghosts, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
And there's also the thing with the cold. It's the way I know the way that the building operates is the air conditioning would not have been on. There's no way that the whole building they would turn have been the cold AC like off. That. Like mm-hmm. it goes off, and they yeah, it's crazy that 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 I've ne- I don't think I've ever yeah. heard that story actually yeah. from you, Frank. Um, I have. I have so I was I was working the night of the Jesus story and um I remember cuz like I saw the pictures like Randolph showed me those pictures yeah. and they're freaky cuz they have there's something orb. there. Yeah, it's like a smoky little wisp orb something and um the other story I have is I had an encounter. I was walking one night um when you close up the main room at the store you have to go and uh you have to bring in all the patio furniture and bring it into like the lobby of the main room and then you have to come around and like lock the door and stuff behind you and i remember i was walking to go like open the door so we could get the patio furniture in and i walk into the lobby of the main room and then i see something fly up and dart behind the counter of the main room uh ticket booth and i went and i looked and there was nothing back there it was just like a i saw like it was like a white sort of thing looked like a sheet uh and it flew up behind and there was nothing bad there weren't like loose papers on the ground or anything and i i i i I turned my flashlight on and i went straight back (laughs) out to the to the or and i made somebody else go in and and open the door (laughs) Because I was yeah. just like, fuck that. I do not want to be involved in whatever is yeah. going and on. Yeah, and also the thing about, I hear a lot of those older stories of like hauntings and stuff. And I remember like certain comics would tell me about like, yeah, I had this experience, chairs and shit, blah, blah. And then like later on, you're talking to another comic telling the story. And then another comic's like, oh, yeah, we used to fuck with Steve when he was drunk all the time. Yeah, we'd stack <laughs> chairs and stuff, follow him around. Because then you realize like some comics are just shit faced and other comics are fucking with them. Like I know, I remember I heard this really well-known it was like a story that i heard a few times from comics and then eleanor kerrigan was like yeah no we would just fuck with them like that was we just (laughs) that was us and then they're like oh shit and also i've seen comics you know comics certain comics have bits late night especially it's late late night we see how don is um with other comics you know they just do like you know bits they've been working on for years that it's late night you know what i mean so that whole thing about like speak now it's like i know where the light switch is and it's mm-hmm. one box at the store it's in the back hallway you can easily hit five switches all at once and the main room goes dark so it's like how much of that is true and how much of that is you know him talking to one of his other like comic homies that's like yo when i do this do this and then it's right like, yeah so yeah, but I mean, just like uh, your friend had like heard the whispering, apparently that during that set or like a few sets, people had heard whispers saying that's him. And like, I guess some people try to draw a line between like Kinnison being a preacher and like these voices saying that's him as like, oh, well, evil forces. With Kinnison, he was he would legit have seances and like do like Ouija board shit. So that's where it's mm-hmm. like the stuff when it comes to him, I fully believe that because it wasn't like, oh, hey, let's Mr. Ghost. He was like, all right, let's get some blood. Let's get some candles. Let's fucking oh, yeah. do some shit. Like oh, he was yeah. deep in it. He went he he was hanging out with like all the the rock stars and all the groupies and everybody in the 80s who was associated with like these crazy hair metal bands and stuff. A lot of them were heavy partiers and a lot of them were also very into the to the occult and the supernatural kind of stuff too. So probably I mean there's probably a lot of bad uh shit going on in the store to begin <laughs> with anyway as far as like I mean there's places where if you're in the belly room for instance in the green room, there's a little outcropping where you can go into, and it's a place where Mickey Cohen would have his gunmen, and they would have it trained on if they had a target that they were going to get rid of that night. They would have it trained on a particular table, and so you can see, like, that that table, and then a couple other tables right around it, so you would have the gunmen. In oh, my God. Post. Um, there were tunnels that were going underneath the building that went to the House of Blues across the street and to houses up in the up in the hills 
for for drug running and prohibition and stuff too. Yeah, there was like so, places where mistresses would stay, like the I, I, like certain neighborhoods in Hollywood. That would be like that's where all those guys' mistresses would stay. They they'd all put them in the same apartment and stuff. Yeah, I I'd learned that because mm-hmm. of the apartment that I lived in and like the neighborhood. So it like it's it affects it's it's crazy how widespread it it was. That's so crazy. And did you did either of you guys like? believe in ghosts before you heard about these things or like experience them personally i mexicans i think it's very cultural it is like yeah like ghosts and shit (laughs) yeah i believed in ghosts i'd never had any experiences until i started working at the comedy store but i definitely believed in stuff that was like i'd heard stories from people uh back home growing up so but i just never experienced it. it was like you know, you have your like healthy amount of skepticism, but also you're like, ah, oh, that's it's not out of the question. Like it could happen. And then when I had that experience happen to me in the lobby of the main room, I yeah. mean, it's so minor, but it was just like it freaked me out so bad because I was like, I can't explain you Steve that. Simone's story. Steve Simone's no, got a great Steve's story. story. So Andrew, I think it was, uh, oh, fuck, Steve Simone and Dice Clay are really close, right? And I don't know if you both know both of them are Jewish, right? You know that. Right. Yeah. So they then right. they're, they're very spiritual people. They believe, right? So Simone used to be like the manager at the comedy store. So he'd have to close everything up, and he hated the belly room and stuff. Like he would just talk about how like creepy it was and everything. And I guess one night he went and uh, up to the belly room to close it, and he heard like a deep growl, like a crazy deep growl, like an animal's growl from the belly room, and he it. it terrified him like the sound of a huge big big dog is what he said and he said it scared him so much that he like ran downstairs right and like immediately called dice because that's like his boy and he was like describing to him and stuff and uh dice goes uh put the money in the safe and just get the fuck out he goes what he goes just put your keys down Put your money in the safe. He goes, I don't care how much. He's like, I got to do the bank. I got to use. I don't give a fuck. I'll cover all of that. Just get over to my house right now. He goes, don't. He goes, lock it up. Just leave. Don't even. He's like, just fucking leave. And like, he was like, all right. Because it was like terrifying. And he said he was like, the noises that he heard was like loud, heavy, like, like just heavy shit. Like, you know, so he was like, he immediately left, went to Dice's. And they, like, read, like, a Bible passage and shit together. But, like, Dice was, like, I was in the belly room once, and I heard that same sound. And when I turned, it was a huge dog. It was, like, a huge, evil fucking-looking dog. And it was just, he was, like, he said he saw that, and he got in his, he's, like, the day that he saw that, he got in his car, and he never, it took him years to come back to the store. He was, like, he was, like, no, yeah, it was, like, a big deal. That's so crazy because like his whole and like obviously like your stage presence is different from like who you are day to day. But like his whole thing is being like this like macho, like cocky, like don't fuck with me kind of guy. And that's why it's like so, so terrifying to see that guy be like, no, fuck that. Yeah. Yeah. And I've never heard. I've never seen Simone so scared, like hearing him retell it. It wasn't like here's this scary tour. It was like traumatic. He was like he was like, listen, he's like, I don't know, but and like it, it pained him to tell us the story. We're like, what the fuck? Yeah, it was crazy. He was, he was like, he was like the sounds that he heard in the belly room. It sounded like big crashing. He was like, it was like heavier than any of the equipment that they have in that room. He was like, it sounded like it was shaking mm-hmm. the foundation. I was like, that is wild. Oh my god. Yeah. So, do you guys like in in like the paranormal world? There are like different types of hauntings. Like, there's yeah. a residual haunting where like the ghost will just like redo the same thing over and over yeah, again. Yeah. They're intelligent things where like they'll interact with people. Do you have like an opinion on what you I, think might be there? Yeah, I think it's it a really little bit is. everything. I think it's a lot of things. I think, you know what it's like when you walk into a room and two people have just had a crazy argument or your parents mm-hmm. or whatever. And you're like, Oh, I can feel that. I think energies and shit like that. So like, like if, you know, you could feel it. You could feel that sadness when it's like, yeah, uh, you know, there's a family's been murdered or whatever, and you're walking around. Like if you're at a crime scene or whatever the fuck, I think that's very true of the store. It's like you've had people been murdered, so many dreams have been crushed, so much like <laughs> anger, mm-hmm. sadness. That place mm-hmm. is like an a, 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 a rod for raw emotion. 
yeah, it's a it's a lightning rod for all of the uh, the energy, like the bad energy that people have felt over the years of the things that the building has gone through between being a mob hideout to being uh, a comedy club to having you know all of these crazy experiences yeah. uh, in between. I think it's definitely got like some benign hauntings, but also some really like there's probably some dangerous yeah. stuff going on in those. People always those talk walls. about how the wall is uh, the store is sentient and that she can you know. And yeah, the store has feelings. Yeah, the yeah, store the has building, feelings. The building, you can tell. The building knows. The building. And it's very, like, people focus on, like, the scary stuff and the and the dark stuff. But it, it is a building of, like, you know, all the good things that have happened and how much it's taken care of comics and all that jazz. is. Mm-hmm. It's it, People describe it as a dark, scary place. And it is, but it is also a very good and honest place. But it is crazy to think of um, the building <laughs> as, like, sentient and it, it being, like, its own entity. Because mm-hmm. it, it kind of is. Yeah, well, a lot of people say that, like, uh, theaters in general, like, most of them are haunted. And I think I it's because yeah. if you believe, like, the whole energy thing, performers, whether it's, you know, you're an actor or you're a comedian, there's just so much emotion behind it. Like, that, that, that's you why know, they, that's why right. they have that light on the stage, right? That's like an old superstition, like an old myth. What light? So if you're in what most light? theaters... They'll have a single light in the middle of the stage, usually kind of like where the microphone stand is and stuff. They'll have that on while it's dark. Like that's what is one to so you can they say one for you to see, like if you're closing up and all that and stuff. But also they say it's to give the uh, spirits and the ghosts, uh, you know, a light to be guided by. It's fucking especially that's how it's like a sign of respect. Yeah, that's how deep the, Mm. um, you know, spiritual connection to like theater and performances. Yeah, yeah interesting yeah there's a I lot of like that uh, when you, you you're right to bring it up when he comes into theater and stuff and to, you know like yeah like just think about the old globe theater you know shakespeare's old spot yeah mm-hmm. yeah i think because i think uh, you know again for people who don't do comedy they think comics are just like a group of happy-go-lucky people who are just ribbing each other here and there and it's just like you know it's a very positive experience and for some people it is but for a lot of people there is a lot there's a lot of work behind it and you know a lot of emotion too yeah and especially because i think i mean in the arts in particular and in comedy in particular there's definitely a sort of sub industry that's predicated on taking the people who have like the dream of doing the thing and then sort of sucking mm-hmm. their money out so they can fund their own life. Um, And for a very long time, that kind of behavior happened at the Mm -hmm. comedy store. So that changed very recently when the club sort of went through its big resurgence over the past five or so years. And uh, a lot of those more predatory uh, practices and, and bookers were no longer a part of the fabric there. But I mean, given how much that that probably happened over the years too, I mean, just the just the emotion of like thinking you know what you're doing, and then and then just having these people just like greedily taking your money away or taking your time and and making you believe you have something when you don't, like that all has to just get. get I remember I actually up. broke some kid's heart once. I was working the back door. And, uh, yeah, this kid was like, I'm going to keep doing the shows and blah, blah, blah. This is fun, right? And I go, yeah, if, you know, you want your family to keep paying money to see you do stand-up. And then I never saw that kid do stand-up again. Aww. And I was like, ah. I do remember, like, it is it is nice when you see somebody doing a bringer show and you can tell they're actually talented. And then you can go and be like, hey, you should, you're doing other open mics, right? Like, you should go. Like, I remember Hannah Einbinder when she was doing shows she was doing crazy cindy shows and i think i'd seen her twice and i was like she actually like is funny like she has something and i went up to her i was like hey you're doing other open mics right like you're doing spots and she was like yeah yeah i've got these places and i was like go to these places too like hit them all stop up. doing and this then, spot <laughs> <laughs> don't do this yeah show quit anymore. don't yeah, do yeah. this show anymore go do yeah, other yeah. shows this <laughs> Now, I was going to ask you guys, too, like, why you think, uh, like, so many spirits or whatever might be attached to the place. But it kind of sounds like a lot of emotion 
kind of ties energy or, you know, quote unquote spirits to the building. Yeah. And I think, you know, the emotions of like what happens in sort of present day and in the recent past combined with the fact that there were a lot of murders and, uh, and the, you know, the sort of back alley abortion deal was going on. I mean, even there, you know, there's been recent, violent activity Someone got, yes, the comedy the store, guy got right? shot there was there was a shooting there yeah the shooting happened barely five years ago you know i think and and that was all that kind of stuff like it doesn't happen nearly as often as it used to just because the club is a very different kind of business now the yeah now there's a new like, ghost that wears timberland all of that <laughs> but all of that stuff from the past the the ghosts of whatever happened then I, I would imagine it are probably feeding on all of that dark negative energy that comes from uh, the the agony of being. A, <laughs> yeah, a all the young comics are just feeding mobster ghosts now and like allowing them to growl at yeah. people. <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to do this. My pleasure. Um, it was really fun. I didn't know. Yeah, thanks for having yeah, us. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know a lot about what you guys had experience uh so uh people who want to follow jay he's at diet jay on all platforms uh you can follow this will scare you on facebook twitter instagram um and check out jay's album good guy with a gun and frank can be found on twitter at frank comedy and on instagram at frank castillo his podcast is called buddies with frank and jp and Thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Frank and Jay, for uh, chatting with me today. Thank you. Thank you.